Eisenhower had generated uh, uh, and could have uh, passed on to Richard Nixon. But the point here is that 1960 was the first time that the two political parties had actively competed with each other for the black vote. And that put the proto-black political class, small as it was, right in the spotlight. And we see uh, that that class, uh, not just of elected officials, because there were so few, uh, but politically active black folks, uh, becoming decidedly uh, close to the Democrats, and especially to the Kennedy brothers. And we move forward to the 1963 March on the White House, which was done in collaboration with the Kennedys. And we have the intervention by Malcolm X, uh, talking about cream in the coffee. And uh, he's describing it as the farce uh, on Washington. And basically what he's saying is that the big six, and those were the heads of the civil rights organizations, uh, SNCC, uh, CORE, uh, SCLC, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Urban League. <laughs> but they were called the Big Six, and they uh, constituted uh, black leadership. And Malcolm uh, was saying that, well, they're getting too close to these Kennedys. So he launched uh, this uh, derisive campaign uh, against them. It was pretty damn mean, too. Uh, but what was unique about it, or not unique, what was important politically about it was that he, Malcolm, in this period, uh, uh, with his criticism of the Big Six and the March on Washington, made it honorable, legitimate, and respectable to critique uh, this self-anointed black leadership class uh, and uh, to question their integrity and their motives when they got too close to power. Remember, th this is unprecedentedly close for black people in our history up to that point, uh, uh, being uh, intimate uh, with the Kennedys, uh, collaborating on a demonstration. This was the party that not too long before it was dominated by the Dixiecrats, and they were still there in uh, the party. So this was heady stuff for the black political uh, class, uh, and Malcolm wanted to break that up. And in doing so, uh, he opened up the entire black political conversation. He said, it's all right. You don't have to protect these guys uh, because uh, if you criticize them, the white people will hear it. And you know, we shouldn't air our dirty linen in public. He said, you know, that's, that is one of our that, that's, that's part of our weapon, the airing of dirty linen in public. And these people have to be made accountable to black people. Uh, so so this, this changes uh, the entire uh, conversation. <laughs> and we, we now have uh, the room uh, to talk about, well, why are you meeting? with these people? Why are you getting close uh, to these people? What is the subject of your discussion? Uh, what's, what's your goal? Uh, aren't we talking about power? See, we can really start talking about power when some of our people actually are in proximity to power, and we can question what they're going to do uh, with that closeness. And so the, this, this flows from the breakthrough at Little Rock, which was really essentially not about school desegregation. It was about the image of the United States, uh, which had to be totally reconsidered so that they would reverse an 80-year-old decision uh, that the federal government was not going to protect uh, the rights of black people. Uh, the 1963 March on Washington was important for that reason at least as much as for the fact that it had 200,000 people. The 200,000 people is just numbers, but the, the character of the black uh, conversation, the internal struggle among black folks about where we are going, what is the nature of our movement, that's much more important even than the march uh, itself. And as I said, it, it defines what the 60s was, an era uh, that ended with as Brother Yeshe Taylor has uh, so often 
explain the crushing of the revolutionary forces, uh, an era that ended with the emergence of a black misleadership class despite uh, Malcolm's efforts, uh, and with a Southern strategy by Richard Nixon that transformed the Republican Party into the white man's party that the Dixiecrats uh, had been. And this thus creating a situation uh, in which, although there were two parties uh, in the duopoly, white, black people could only be in one. And so the path of the black political class uh, from, then, from that point onward was to be part of the Democratic Party. Uh, so that is as important as any other development in the 60s uh, because it brings us to where we are uh, today. Uh, and of course, possibly the most devastating development to come out of that de decade uh, was the imposition of mass black incarceration, uh, which should be seen as the actual structure of fascism in the United States. Uh, we are the biggest police state in the world uh, because we have the most uh, captives. I don't, I don't know how you can define such a country uh, except as a fascist regime. So the question here, and I deliberately uh, uh, left all these things dangling, uh, the question is not whether black people should engage in electoral politics. Uh, I think when you do an analysis, uh, you, you go into it with, with, without uh, having uh, made up your mind. You, you examine uh, the issues and see where they go. The question is not whether black people should engage in electoral politics, uh, as well, of course, as mass movement politics. Uh, we should be engaged in all kinds of politics. The question is, does voting actually have an effect on the basic ruling structures in the United States under capitalism at this stage uh, in history? Uh, this is a system that devours everything. It devours jobs, it devours our neighborhoods, and it also devours uh, the effectiveness of the vote. Uh, when we look at cities, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, Akile uh, touched uh, on this subject uh, in her talk. When we look uh, at cities, much of the business of governance uh, is beyond the voter. We, we have uh, huge regional boards which are uh, staffed by corporate executives or people named by corporate executives that actually decide what kinds of jobs are going to come into the region. Uh, that means what kind of people are going to come into the region and what kind of jobs and people are going to leave. Uh, things like in New Jersey, uh, the uh, Port Authority of Newark, uh, of New York and New Jersey, uh, which is a regulator uh, of, of of, of the economy and, and therefore the kinds of folks who will uh, live there. Uh, we have uh, most uh, urban school districts uh, no longer uh, have the kind of autonom autonomy uh, that Khalid was talking about earlier uh, to make decisions about how money is spent. As soon as black folks uh, became the majorities in so many of these uh, cities, the powers of school boards was taken away, uh, either by uh, strong mayor uh, districts or, like in New Jersey, uh, the state. Uh, what does that mean in terms of running for the school board? Well, uh, I think it means that we do run for the school board, but we tell the truth. Uh, in Jersey City, for example, which uh, was the first uh, district in that state to be taken over uh, by the state government. Uh, we had a uh, radical uh, black preacher uh, who ran and won uh, every election for the school board. Uh, and his job, as he saw it, was to denounce the entire 
apparatus as being a sham and a travesty on democracy uh, and to exhort people to get rid of it. Uh, and uh, he certainly uh, did a service uh, in doing that. That is, we can run, I'm using this as an extreme example, we can run for offices that are actually useless to our people to explain that they are useless and why they rendered them useless. You serve democracy by explaining that you don't really have democracy, which means you need to demand some, something more fundamental than you've been uh, demanding. So, so yes, of course we need to run for offices, even those offices uh, that are presently uh, worthless in, in terms of uh, doing anything for our people. Uh, but. We, we now live in an era in which the system that people are calling neoliberalism uh, destroys whole black metropolises uh, in terms of the, their democratic content. The biggest black metropolis uh, in our country, uh, Detroit, uh, rendered bankrupt and disenfranchised uh, by corporate forces and not just by the action of a Republican governor in Michigan. President Obama and the whole of the Democratic Party okayed the deal that ratified the disenfranchisement of the people of Detroit. And not just Detroit, uh, in Michigan, every heavily black city was brought under an emergency manager regime, which means that you didn't have a vote on local uh, issues, resulting in the majority of black people in the state of Michigan being disenfranchised. And yet we have a Democratic Party that makes a big to-do uh, about ID cards, which are important and do uh, impact some percentage of the population, voter ID and such. But here we have half of the black folks in Michigan who lose their vote, and this Democratic Party collaborates with the Republicans because they're both corporate parties uh, serving the same people uh, to disenfranchise uh, half, half of the black folks in the state. Uh, the same applies uh, to the charterization of schools. It, it is to take the schools out of the public domain. It is, the, it is an extension of the takeovers of local school boards by the state. It is a fundamental denial of democracy. Only when you charterize them, it's rather permanent, uh, as opposed to the state coming in and maybe it'll uh, leave. Uh, it, it takes it out of the public uh, sphere. Uh, and that is where uh, the system is moving. And, it's not just a question of black folks and electoral politics. It's a question about uh, how much is there left, potentially, of democracy, that is, bourgeois democratic rights, as we used to say, uh, in the United States. What is there uh, to avail ourselves of? Uh, and is it worth the time and the effort to do that? Uh, is there something else we could be doing? Uh, well, there's a lot of things that we could do. We need to be doing everything, as I said uh, before. Uh, and, and clearly, uh, the Black is Back Coalition has the right idea, at least in theory, in terms of balance. That movement politics, social movement, uh, is, the, is the key, is the emphasis. Uh, but that running for, uh, for electoral office uh, can enhance the work of social movements, can be a spokesperson, uh, a candidate, can be a spokesperson at a different uh, level, uh, sometimes to a different audience uh, for the demands that have been raised by the movement. But one thing is sure, although uh, you, uh, a movement can certainly produce uh, candidates, uh, candidates do not produce movements. Uh, and so people who say, I'm going to run for office because I want to start a movement are full of it, you see. Start a movement first, and then we'll see if the movement wants you uh, to run for office on its behalf. And I think I've used up my time. I know I used up my breath. That's why you, you've heard me huffing. <laughs> uh, 
I want to thank uh, Brother Glenn for that incredible presentation. What I'd like to do, uh, with your permission, is uh, just ask uh, everybody to just to stand up for a moment and let some of the blood leave that portion of your body that's attached to the seat. Uh, just, just for a minute. We're going to take a break uh, after a, a few minutes, but I, I think this was an important discussion. And I see you, Attorney Du. Uh, <laughs> I see you, Attorney Du. I, I think this was an important discussion. And uh, uh, yes, what I would like to do uh, now, I'm, I'm going to come right to you, Attorney Du, if you don't mind. Okay. Write it down, because you'll forget it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was an important discussion, and I think it's also important that uh, Brother Glenn introduced this issue and question of fascism. We're hearing a lot about fascism these days, particularly since the emergence of Donald Trump. Uh, and I've heard him characterized as proto-fascist and all kinds of things, and particularly by African people, and particularly by African people who are leftists. And I heard this even before Trump, I heard it uh, coming from some people who uh, I have respected a lot uh, and who Glenn debated even, uh, coming out of New Jersey, who characterized uh, a McCain at that time as the fascist that we had to be concerned about. And you're wasting your vote if you work for Cynthia McKinney, or if you voted for Cynthia McKinney because you're going to repeat the error that was made in Germany in the 1930s that allowed Hitler, uh, when the left's split and, and uh, allowed Hitler to ascend uh, 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 to the head of state. And uh, so that was the first time we began to hear this. And, and there are several people who call themselves black leftists who uh, united with, uh, with this uh, position that was coming from Amiri Baraka out of Jersey. Uh, some people who I knew supported that same uh, position, people who were really important to me. I thought they were important in the 1960s and what have you. And uh, the next time we hear it is from uh, around the question of Trump. Trump was the proto